Uh, today I have uh, Janie Revere, our Labor Director, Alex Adams, my Budget Chief, Jeremy Field in the, uh, in the back practicing good distancing, the Regional Administrator of the Small Business Administration, uh, Dave Jepson, our Health and Welfare Director and Chairman of my Coronavirus Working Group. I'm sure everyone saw the news yesterday that Idaho had its first deaths resulting from coronavirus. Our prayers are with the families and loved ones of those who pass. This is a sad reminder that coronavirus can be extremely harmful or deadly to many, and we all must take personal responsibility and do everything we can to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Most importantly, people must stay home as much as possible for the next three weeks. The coronavirus situation has not affected only our daily lives and personal finances, but our state's finances as well. Although the state budget will take a hit from the disruption in our economy in recent weeks, I want to assure Idahoans we have a plan to ensure governmental services will continue and we will meet our constitutional requirement for a balanced state budget without having to raise taxes. First off, I want to acknowledge and thank President Trump and Congress for bringing forth a $2 trillion stimulus plan to battle the harmful effects of COVID-19 pandemic. The bill is known as the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, and I understand it just passed the House. The package will provide critical relief to Idahoans we anticipate that Idaho will receive at least $1.25 billion for coronavirus relief fund. And that will also be targeted to support, including direct payments to Americans, $1,200 for adults and $500 per child, lending funds for businesses, an educational stabilization fund for school districts and colleges, among other things. To bolster the money available for Idaho's direct response to coronavirus, I will be signing an executive order directing the transfer of $39.3 million from the Tax Relief Fund to the Disaster Emergency Account. That is the maximum amount allowable under law. My executive order will make money immediately available for critical needs and will keep Idaho safe, specifically it will allow us to purchase more personal protection equipment for first responders and healthcare workers, more test kits to minimize the spread, more lab supplies and hospital beds, beds to boost critical care capacity, build additional surge capacity, including conversion costs for temporary care facilities, hazard pay, or other support for essential services such as child care. Child care. Wraparound services for mobile food, essential hygiene, additional public health district staff, and funds for health care worker contracts. We do anticipate that under the CARES Act, the federal funding will cover some of these expenses, but this action is intended to ensure Idaho does not have to wait on critical supplies. The time to act is now. I'm also signing another executive order that reduces state spending for the current fiscal year by 1%. As, as we all are too aware, economic pressures are growing throughout the United States due to the ongoing pandemic. I appreciate the efforts of my colleagues in the legislature in preparing for times like this. Together, we have been making efforts at rebuilding our rainy day funds, ensuring only small conservative growth in our budgets. While the impact of the pandemic on state revenue collection is yet unknown, we must do everything we can to ensure the state is positioned for long-term success. To ensure we can deliver a balanced budget at the end of this fiscal year, I'm requesting the agencies hold back 1% of their general fund appropriation, that will save us approximately $40 million statewide. I am exempting agencies with essential personnel providing direct support 
to the state's coronavirus response, including public health districts. In some cases, we anticipate federal aid under the CARE Act will offset these reductions. These actions are never easy. Our agency directors, who have done a tremendous job in managing through tough times and making sure we emerge stronger. Their preparation since last fall will continue to minimize the impact of these reductions on Idahoans. Also today, I'm signing a proclamation to help Idahoans who are tempor temporarily unable to work through no fault of their own because of illness, quarantines, layoff or reductions of work related to coronavirus. The Idaho Department of Labor announced yesterday that 13,341 new claims were filed for unemployment insurance benefits from Idaho workers laid off due to coronavirus. That was up 12,300 from the previous work for a 1,200% increase in just a matter of days. As an aside, to put unemployment in perspective, had the coronavirus pandemic not occurred, we would have announced record employment and an Idaho 2.7% unemployment rate. My proclamation is designed to help people get the financial help they need as quickly as possible. For unemployment insurance claimants, the proclamation does the following things. It waives the one-week waiting period for all applicants who are otherwise eligible. The order makes it easier for claimants to be considered as job attached if they've been laid off due to COVID-19 related reasons. An employer must provide reasonable insurance of a return to work and the claimant must be able and available and suitable for work. The order considers claimants have met the available for work criteria if they are isolated or unable to work at the request of a medical professional, their employer, or their local health district, and they will be returning to their employer. And finally, the order provides parties an additional 14 days to appeal claims decisions uh, beyond the normal 14 days. For employers, Businesses who pay a quarterly unemployment tax, who pay quarterly unemployment tax, will not be charged when their employers are laid off due to coronavirus. Parties will be given an additional 14 days to appeal claims decisions beyond the normal 14 days. These provisions are in effect on March 8, 2020. My actions today further position the state of Idaho and its citizens to overcome this challenge we're facing. Now, uh, before I introduce uh, Jeremy, the, uh, the regional administrator of the Small Business Administration to talk about their resources, I wanna stress to my fellow Idahoans, we will get through this. Uh, everything that I've talked about here, everything we've done before this is for your benefit. Uh, these actions, we are being proactive uh, to make sure that we stay safe. I will always, uh, uh, Director Jepson and I always refer to this chart. Our goal is to minimize those little orange boxes, which are uh, capacity needed uh, that we need in our healthcare system. And every one of these actions is to help that. So with that, uh, Jeremy, do you wanna tell us about the Small Business Administration? Thank you, Governor. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and, and address uh, the great state of Idaho. Um, I have a great deal of confidence in, in our governor. I don't know anyone in the state who's more prepared to leave the economic challenges that we are facing at this time. And uh, the staff that he has uh, are more than competent and capable of handling this uh, phenomenon that we know as the coronavirus. The White, House is at, um, the White House has asked the SBA to be the tip of the spear as we go through um, this crisis. Small businesses are being affected. I've heard hundreds of stories of small businesses as they struggle and have lost more than half their revenue. They don't want to lay off their people. They want to take care of their people and they don't know what to do. And so they're looking to 
the White House, to Congress, and to the SBA for help. And help is coming. Uh, we know that the Senate passed the health care bill, and just on my way here to the Capitol, that the uh, House side has passed their, uh, their bill. And so, it, in short order, it will go to the White House for signature. The nature of this crisis is different than any of the SBA has ever, been, has ever known. When FEMA goes to a crisis area for a hurricane or a tornado, the SBA is there with them to provide disaster loans for people, for small businesses and homeowners to get back on their feet. We often issue details to the SBA and employees come to help be able to talk people through disaster loans and give them assistance. But because of the nature of this crisis, we're not able to be on the ground like we were. And our, uh, therefore, we have pushed uh, all of our services online. Now, because of the infrastructure uh, that is needed to handle the uh, capacity of loans that we are getting at this time, the, in, in, the website has had intermittently been updated and people have not been able to get online. Currently, that website is active and working well. We are constantly working to meet the challenges of updating that infrastructure and making sure people can get online to get the funds that they need. So with that, I have to read you from my cell phone some of the updates that have ch changed as of uh, just recently with the passing of the House bill. Uh, I want to tell you that they're, they're in this, the CARE Act, the Coronas Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, there is a provision called the Paycheck Protection Program and Loan Forgiveness. The Paycheck Protection Program will provide $350 billion for 100% federally guaranteed loans for eight weeks of assistance to small businesses, as well as 501c3s and 50c19 nonprofit veteran organizations. Sole proprietors, independent contractors, and other self-employed individuals are also eligible for these loans. These loans can be forgiven when used for payroll costs, interest on mortgage obligations, rent, and utilities. SBA certified lenders and non-SBA lenders will be authorized to make paycheck protection loans, which will alleviate a lot of the bottleneck that we are seeing with uh, our online portal at this time. The Secretary of the Treasury has been authorized to work with the SBA to expedite the process. I can tell you right now that most lenders in Idaho are SBA guaranteed lenders, and those that aren't, we will work with to make sure that they are SBA lenders so that you can work with your local lending institutions to get access to the funds that you need to keep your doors open and your people paid as we deal with this crisis. Uh, other uh, announcements will be, to, will be followed, uh, but uh, this is a welcome news and the SBA has been working with congressional leadership to make sure that we are ready to go into action once the president signs this legislation. If you are uh, going online to apply for a disaster loan, you can receive right now until the president signs the bill up to $2 million in disaster relief through an EIDL loan, an economic injury disaster loan. You can go to sba.gov forward slash disaster and follow the hot links to uh, apply uh, via our online portal. Once your application is submitted, you can check the status of your loan at 1-800-659-2955 or email disastercustomerservice at sba.gov. Questions about SBA loans and counseling can be directed to our SBA district office. Our phone number here in Boise is 208-334-9004. We also have our certified uh, resource partners who, provide, who receive uh, grant funding from the SBA. We have our Small Business Development Center here locally. They can be reached at 208 426 3875. We have our Treasure Valley Score Chapter, 208 334 1696. And our Women's Business Center uh, is at 208 996 1572. These resources are free and made possible by federal grant dollars. It's a sad reality that uh, at times like this, scammers do come online. And if anyone is charging you for advice or counseling on an SBA loan, we ask you that you please contact with us with their uh, contact information so that we can uh, deal with that. But just know that if you call any of the services I've just talked about, our district office here in Boise, our Small Business Development Center, our Treasure Valley Score Chapter, or our Women's Business Center, uh, they will help you uh, walk through the loan process and also deal with anyone who's, um, we'll refer on to their appropriate sources, anyone who's trying to charge you for these services. If you are looking for updates like we all are, 
Once they've been properly vetted through our congressional team, you can receive updates via email at sba.gov forward slash updates. And you can always follow us via Twitter at SBA Pacific NW, Pacific Northwest, and at SBA Gov. Uh, I want everyone to stay healthy. I know that our governor, the president, and our congressional delegation, as well as the SBA, is fighting for America's small businesses every day. And I have confidence that as we go through this crisis, we will come out stronger. Thank you. Sign this, and then we'll answer some questions. Okay. Yes. How soon is the um, how soon is the small business and unemployment claim information going to be webbed up on the state's websites? Janie, uh, the question was uh, uh, for the. I'll let Jeremy ask, answer the SBA question. Was. Uh, uh, is all this information available on, on the Department of Labor website now? Uh, we are updating our website right now to reflect the executive order, uh, and our systems are being updated, so no one will need to contact our office to be eligible for these programs if they are already in the system. And, and I think Jeremy gave uh, eight websites that were available from the small business. What's, what's the one central one, Jeremy? Go to sba.gov forward slash updates. You'll receive email updates on all the new information that, that's coming down the pipe, or you just follow us at Twitter at SBA Pacific NW. Okay. Yes. As this crisis continues? As in regard to what? Halting evictions. Uh, actually, we've, we've talked... There's some of this taking place at the courts about, because uh, the courts have dialed way back to handle their social uh, distancing. So that's one regard. Um, we know that the uh, larger commercial uh, 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 renters, uh, landlords are, are available for these SBA loans. Uh, what we're reaching out to is a smaller individual, uh, the person that has you know, two or five or one uh, rentals and what we can do to help them. But that's one side of the issue. The other side of the issue is, is there other bills? Their utility bills, uh, their internet connectivity, because internet connectivity is so important in this time. And we've reached out to the utilities, both the municipal utilities and the publicly owned utilities about what we can do there. Uh, there there's activity taking place um, and I think the individual uh, renters, uh, the landlords, uh, the system is such that uh, foreclosures uh, is going to be uh, slowed down. And the other advice I'm giving them is this isn't necessarily a good time to be evicting people because there might not be anybody waiting in the wings. Uh, this flow of cash is coming from the federal government through unemployment or through any of these other programs, uh, they just need to be patient and we're counseling them to do that. Bill? Governor, you talked about uh, doing two things from an economic standpoint. One is transferring uh, a little over 39 million from the uh, tax relief fund into the emergency fund, and then the 1% holdback, which uh, might save an additional $40 million. Correct. So that's roughly $80 million this fiscal year. What's the expense side of that? What's that money help you do? Well, the 30 million, there's uh, two different $40 million pots. One of them is just to make up for the loss of tax revenue that we anticipate. So it's gone. Uh, we think it's gone. That's, you know, these forecasts are, are moving hourly. And so that 40 million is gone. The other 40 million is to have it available. Some of these other sources of money may backfill it, but because of these critical uh, uh, personal protection equipment, all these other needs are so critical, we just want to have resources there. Some of them will get backfilled, but we don't want to wait in some pipeline uh, when I've got a, a health care provider or a hospital that has critical needs. And so that just makes $40 million more available on top of the other money we've got. So, Keith? How much is the revenue shortfall that you're predicting? 
We don't know. Uh, we know it. We know it's. Uh, uh, we know this number is going to be is is going to be necessary. Uh, but you know the way the markets are going, uh, that that's one thing. But uh, there are not very many people hiring right now, and there's way more people that are going on unemployment. Sales tax numbers are down for particularly big ticket items. Uh, you can imagine what the personal uh, uh, income tax and the corporate income tax are doing. So. We believe that this $40 million, given what we had before, uh, that we will have a balanced budget at the end of the year. But it's the, the, the first of the month, April 1, we'll, we'll have a better hard set on what we think our numbers are. Have you spoken to any uh, critical care physicians about the, about the feasibility of stringing ventilators together? Uh, have we, <laughs> a lot. Uh, we have talked to uh, 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 Director Jepson, uh, uh, our Idaho Office of Emergency uh, Management. Uh, we spend a lot of time. Uh, we have uh, the ho hospitals and a former hospital administrator uh, on our coronavirus working group. Uh, that is a critical issue. Um, a, personnel, B, uh, PPE, but uh, capacity uh, ventilator capacity. Uh, matter of fact, I talked to the president about it. So that's how high it is. Uh, we've we've made a request uh, uh, through FEMA uh, for more uh, ventilators, uh, and that's that is a high priority. But I have to have personnel to run them, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons some of these things in this order are to make sure that we preserve our personnel. Uh, that uh, a ventilator standing without anybody. Uh, a place to put it or somebody to operate it doesn't do us a lot of good. Uh, Governor Little, did pressure from local governments contribute to your decision to issue the stay-at-home order earlier this week? Well, it was the stay-at-home order was a result of of a policy that uh, that our our coronavirus working group came up with about when X happens we do Y, and when we got community spread we first had it limited just to Blaine County, uh, we did the isolation order there, and then when we saw uh, that we have it here in the Treasure Valley, uh, we we've, we've got it's kind of creeping up in the Magic Valley, uh, Kootenai County has it. We saw we had it from literally one end of the state to the other. Uh, we did it based on our analysis, uh, modern epidemiology, and the direction we got from CDC. Uh, uh, local government was, uh, and, and we're attentive to their needs, but this was done basically on the best practices of epidemiology. Governor, the SBA loans, um, First, I'm curious what the interest rate on those is, and secondly, I'm also curious that given that the economy is, for many businesses, is shut down, even if it's a 0% loan, I'm not sure how beneficial a, a loan is to them. So talk, can somebody well, talk a little bit about what Well, money I'll, I'll let Jeremy uh, talk about what the interest rate, but I know I was on a call with the president yesterday, and he said something about a, uh, I, th I think the, I assume the language didn't get changed from yesterday since I was on the call. It, uh, if if these businesses keep people employed, uh, the, he he said some, a forgivable loan. I don't know what. And I said, well, that's a grant uh, rather than a loan. And so, uh, but there's all these different programs. But I, Jeremy, what what's the interest rate on these loans? So currently for the disaster loan, the interest rate is 3.75% for a business loan and 2.75% for a nonprofit. Again, that may change in this legislation. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, I've, you know, it, you're correct that that is more of a grant. Uh, you can pair the, this new uh, federal forgivable loan with disaster loans if that's not sufficient. Um, and, and I've, and, you know, a lot of people that worry about uh, the strings that come with the, anything dealing with the federal government. We've, we've heard those concerns over and over. The only thing I can say is if a loan um, gets you through this time, is it better than shuttering your doors? And fortunately, we have a 30, um, 
a 30-year amortization. So whatever you do loan that is not a, f a forgivable loan from the SBA can be made into a very de minimis payment to help you get through this time. Our goal is to keep these uh, keep people working, and so anything we can do to help these businesses, particularly the ones, uh, you know, the, the, I, I'm sure there are businesses that were, uh, you know, will go, but the ones that want to stay, uh, we want to do all we can to help them because that's that's going to allow us when we get on the other end of that curve uh, to get our economy uh, back in the condition it was before, which is uh, my number one goal. Uh, what is being done to support rentals with uh, property management regulations? What is being done to what? Uh, support rentals with uh, property management regulations. Well, w we looked at a lot of regulations that uh, uh, I think the last, uh, um, but those were mainly in the healthcare area. I, uh, we're the least regulated state in the nation. Uh, but uh, we'd look at them. I, I, I don't know exactly what the, uh, what the issue would be uh, as far as if they don't have anybody in their rentals, uh, they probably don't have a problem. Uh, for the most part, uh, I'm pretty attentive to the needs of business. I haven't heard a lot of complaints, but if there's a specific issue they get a hold of the governor's office, we'll look at it. Governor, you mentioned that uh, had it not been for the shutdown that uh, Idaho would have had a uh, 2.9% uh, unemployment rate. Um, so what did it, uh, w what is the unemployment rate with the new filings and what kind of projections are there for uh, future filings? Well, they're gonna be a lot worse than 2.7, we know that. I mean, the, you can extrapolate the numbers out of the numbers that we just quoted uh, and uh, Janie may know what it is, but those, uh, it, you know, they come out on uh, on Fridays uh, on the national level, and then ours ours come a little later. But uh, uh, believe me, uh, they're not 2.7. Janie, have you got a number? We do not have a number, and we won't for some time. There's a lag in reporting to make sure that we can uh, verify the information and publish that it's correct. Uh, we have received guidance from the federal government that um, we should not be releasing any um, draft numbers until it's all finalized because of the impact that it has on the markets. It's, that's the we, that it's always been, um, they're, they're just maintaining that guidance now. We know it's not good. I mean, that's, that's why we're doing everything we are here. We're trying to ameliorate the, uh, the friction on, on people being able to survive. Keith? Do you anticipate layoffs among the state's 25,000 employees and any cutback in services to residents? Our, well, our, our intent is not to cut back on services at all. Uh, you know, 1%, uh, and most of the agencies that we've talked to, as, as we sent this letter out this morning, uh, you know, I got a great crew working for me, and they were, uh, they, they were doing the right thing. And, and 1%, there's a list of things uh, that they can do uh, to do that. Our intent is not to cut services. But I've got other agencies where what they were doing before is literally the, their job has disappeared because of the uh, lack of some other things going on. In the healthcare field, it's just the opposite. I got a lot of action going there, and that's why they're exempted from it. But there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of agencies whose workload, uh, for a variety of reasons, has actually gone down. And again, we want to be in the best position when this thing turns back that we can flip the switch and and start to grow. But I, I don't know of any state services are going to be negatively impacted or state employees. Governor Little, hospitals are being gouged uh, in for tests, equipment, and uh, basically everything as they're trying to fight the COVID-19 disease that's uh, currently ravaging the state. Are you gonna be doing anything at the state level to try and stop unscrupulous sellers from harming Idaho people for because of these high prices? Well, actually, my first executive order uh, <laughs> empowered the attorney general uh, to people that are price gouging uh, to be subject uh, to arrest. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the president and the uh, US, U.S. Attorney General 
uh, because a lot of these things are across state lines. Uh, so we have to have that partnership with the federal government. But both at the federal level and the state level, uh, if you're price gouging, believe me, you're doing it at great risk. Not sure who this question is for, but yesterday at the Idaho Department of Labor, um, people calling in to file claims were hitting the 55 minute hold time mark and being automatically disconnected. Is anything being done to solve that? Well, Janie can, <laughs> Janie can talk about that capacity. Uh, there's hardly a, a part of the social safety net uh, that we have that's not having a lot of challenges. Uh, and uh, we're trying to address that. One of the last bills the legislature signed was more capacity for us from a, from a technology standpoint, from an internet connectivity standpoint, to boost that up. You can well imagine that that's happening everywhere, including my office, including uh, Director uh, Jepson when people call in at five o'clock to find out what the recent numbers are. Uh, we have made great strides in the last five years about internet connectivity, uh, but you know this is an unprecedented amount of pressure on that system, and I ask the people of Idaho to be a little patient, and maybe Janie can talk about that specific part of it. Yeah, we're having unprecedented amount of calls and, uh, and people filing. Um, I would remind everyone that you do not need to call our office to file. Uh, you can file online. If you have questions about your claim, um, you can try and do click to chat or review the frequently asked questions that we have posted online. Uh, if you are unable to file online and need help with a claim, you can call our office. As you noted, um, we have um, uh, reached our capacity, surpassed our capacity to answer the amount of calls that are coming in. Some people may hit a busy signal, just keep trying back. And um, uh, some people are being timed out because uh, we can't get to them quick enough. We have all hands on deck right now at the Department of Labor. We're doing our best to answer the calls as they come in. Um, as you may know, uh, unemployment insurance is very complex. We can't just hire people off the street and put them on the phones to answer the questions. There's a uh, training period that takes. So we're working on hiring more individuals, but it will take time. Um, in, in the meantime, we ask people to be patient and uh, please don't call our office for questions that aren't related to unemployment insurance. Um, it just fills up the lines for people that are trying to file. Thank you, sorry. So, uh, Governor, this might be a question for Director Jepson as well, but uh, when did you personally learn about the first COVID-19 related death in Idaho? And how and when will the media and public receive notification about COVID-19 related deaths from now on? Uh, David? Sure, Dave, can you come up here? And, uh, good, good suggestion, why'd you poop? Anywhere you want. Thank you. Come up to the microphone. Uh, so the, the question was about when did we first learn about the first COVID death and what's our process going forward? Uh, I personally learned about the first COVID death yesterday. Uh, and when that was just uh, that it was announced, or actually there are three of them. And again, our, our sympathy and prayers go out to those families. Uh, that's when we first learned about it. The process that we're following is um, when a death occurs, we want to make sure that everything happens uh, for any testing that may need to occur, uh, uh, either before or after, and that it's, and the death certificate is certified. And so from a public information perspective, once the death certificate is, is completed and filed, that is when we will be releasing that information. Uh, and so from a process perspective, that's how it'll flow. Sometimes that's complicated. Uh, as you know, we have we've have improved some testing bandwidth but it's not where we would like it to be at this point. So if we have a patient that expires um, and we still need to do a test to confirm COVID, uh, that'll take a little bit of time. But we're gonna run that process. We wanna be factual. Uh, we wanna be really clear and, and as accurate as we can with, those, with that information. Question for the governor. You've been um, pretty busy the last two weeks with news conferences and traveling around the state, meeting a lot of people. Um, so how are you holding up and have you been tested for the virus? And I have not been tested for the virus. I, uh, uh, we practice social distancing everywhere, uh, everywhere we go. Um, I'm, I'm doing fine. I, uh, 
uh, but believe me, uh, you don't go into one of these battles without a good uh, uh, team like I have over here, and uh, that makes things a lot easier. I'm glad it didn't happen last year in my first year as governor. Uh, I'm glad I have the relationships I have with the hospitals, with the cities, with the counties. This morning we had a call with, uh, I know it's hard to believe, all 105 legislators. I don't know how many of them were on the call. Uh, but but this, where, where I am and where we are as a state is a result of all the work that we've done uh, to build relationships, the planning that we've done for emergency management for years, and particularly in the last two months, and the good work of my coronavirus working group. Uh, if, if I had time, I'd sit in on all their meetings. I'm learning... Uh, way more about epidemiology than I ever thought I wanted to know as an animal scientist. Uh, but uh, it, my, my mental health and social health uh, is basically because I'm confident that I'm doing the right thing for the people of Idaho. And it's rewarding to, to always have somebody that's got either the right answer or good options for me to select. And so uh, I'm, I'm doing fine, but believe me, there's pressure and, and you know, these announcing uh, these three uh, uh, fatalities uh, that, that we just had uh, is, is very grave. And, and of course, one of the things when people ask me all the time, uh, you know, everybody that works for the state, everybody that lives in the state, but particularly the people who work for the state, whether they be in public safety or way, or whether they're in the health field, are part of my responsibility. So all we're talking about here, about those two graphs, is to make sure we have that capacity there, that I can keep my health care workers safe, and we can maintain capacity uh, so that we don't have, uh, uh, we have the minimum number of fatalities as a result of this that we can, so. I have a question from Kevin Richard of Idaho Ed News. Is the holdback across the board safe for health agencies and are K through 12 and higher education subject to the holdback? Yes, they are. Uh, as I said, the healthcare, the healthcare uh, agencies are, are exempted. Uh, as you know, uh, last fall, uh, when we were uh, grappling with the reduction in anticipated revenue uh, because of income taxes, I exempted K-12. And, and we, I gave a deep thought on this, but the fact that uh, there's a lot of schools that are out, uh, there's a lot of their variable costs uh, that are not accruing, and so uh, that's why I put public schools uh, into the formula this time, was because of the fact that they were, uh, th there's some savings as a result of their uh, variable costs that they're not accruing right now. Um, are you prepared to support doctors and nurses in the ICUs if they need to ration vent ventilators or other critical medicines if supplies and other contingencies are exhausted? Well, the issue of rationing health care, uh, right now, uh, uh, Dave's uh, committee and, and uh, the whole health care system, whether it's uh, an ambulance district in rural Idaho or our biggest hospitals, we are coordinating all that to make sure we have enough uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, and each individual hospital uh, has a, basically every hospital has an ethics committee, uh, but we are a long way from getting to that. Our goal is to keep that from happening. But all of that is being discussed on a very, very frequent basis uh, with, with the healthcare industry uh, and with our coronavirus working group. Governor, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how the stay-at-home order might affect uh, political assemblies in the future, um, and if there would be any issue with First Amendment rights of Idahoans hoping to Well, it, it, it's uh, just like at the national level, uh, uh, the, our natural instinct if, uh, as a public and as a, a political to have great big rallies are, are are discouraged and frankly in violation of of, uh, of, of this stay home order for 21 days. Um, but my authority under the code for a healthcare crisis, uh, as it has been forever, if you have somebody that is, uh, you're trying to take care of a highly infectious event, it gives you the order to say, we're not gonna have uh, a public gathering. So, 
There's no different between a political gathering than any other gathering. Uh, we are uh, in consultation about what we're going to do about the upcoming election. Uh, we hope to make that decision in a day or so. I know you've been uh, working very hard on trying to prepare for contingencies. I was listening to an extremely scary Blaine County Commissioners meeting immediately before this press conference, and they were discussing things like trying to move money around in order to expand their ambulance capacity which is already at capacity and their hospital is already at capacity. How fast can the state move resources into a place like Blaine County, which is already basically beginning to get broken? Five minutes. I mean, all, all that work has been done. Uh, the, the, the inventory of, uh, the, if, if you go over to the Office of Emergency Management into their center right now, uh, there's great big spreadsheets on the wall and that, team, which is all the agencies, including the philanthropic community is represented there. That team is trying to address, uh, and, and we, I, you, you, you bring up a good point. Uh, I can have ventilators, but if I don't have ambulances to get people from one place to another, that's another issue. But all of that is, is going into uh, the calculations uh, that the people that are addressing this thing are looking at every day. Is that fair? Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Sorry. Last question. Last question. Uh, so there are shortages of tests, swabs, personal protective equipment at the hospital level, but it's also affecting coroners in smaller rural counties around the state. Uh, Ada, Ada County Coroner Dottie Owen said yesterday that they'd been running into some issues with the amount of tests that they have to see if someone does did pass away from COVID-19. Uh, are you guys going to be any doing anything specifically to help coroners throughout the state as they're trying to deal with this and correctly gather death counts? I, I, I don't know specifically. Uh, 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 Brad Ritchie could address that, but coroners are part of this process. Whether it's a emergency, uh, an ambulance district, whether it's a hospital, uh, whoever it is, uh, coroners are part of that process. So they have a, if they have a shortage, but, but I want to, uh, I want to reiterate testing. We are still, um, we are still ramping up testing capacity. Uh, Director Jepson and our state lab, we're about a maximum capacity, which we've increased by, uh, we, we were doing 14 and now we're doing 120. 160 a day, but we're about uh, at maximum capacity. The capacity that's coming online is going to be out-of-state uh, testing, uh, and they're they're getting pressure from everywhere. Um, whether we send them to Salt Lake or Spokane or Portland or wherever they may be, so uh, getting the test results back, we know it's coming online. We know there are a lot of resources at the state level and the federal level that are going into those uh, testing facilities. Um, I don't know of any place where th their, their inventory may be low, but I don't know of any place where they can't do a test. The problem is turnaround time to get the results back. And that's, that's going to get better, no question about it. All right, well, thank you. I, I want to reiterate, uh, this is a time when we need good information flow to the people of the state of Idaho. So for those of you that came out and practiced your social distancing, uh, thank you. But we need to continue to get the message out, and I appreciate what you've done. So thank you.